Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I am Christopher Brown, your host, and today I am pleased and honored to be sitting down with our guest. He is the former Public Security Minister of Alberta, the former Solicitor General of Alberta, the former MLA for the uh, riding of Stony Plain, and he has an extensive career in municipal politics as well. The Honourable Fred Lindsay joins us. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, Fred, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. I look forward to the conversation. So before we get started into the uh, your time in politics, I've asked every single candidate, politician who's ever come on my show the exact same opening question, and you are no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Fred? Well, it, uh, it came uh, from my father initially. Uh, he was very involved in the community, and being his youngest son, I kind of tagged along with him and... Uh, realized early on that uh, you know anybody who lives in a community benefits from that community so I believe and my father certainly believed that it was important to give back to that community. Now you can give back in many different ways whether it be through nonprofits, whether it be through volunteerism but you chose the political route. I'm assuming you volunteered as well but to really give back to your community you chose the political route. What was your decision behind going politically to give back to your community? Well, I got started uh in municipal politics. <clears throat> Excuse me, shortly after uh, I was married probably in 1969 and 70, wife and I lived in a smaller summer village. And uh, at that time, I was also a municipal policeman and uh, they were looking for volunteers to serve in their council. So I thought, well, this is going to be interesting to see. Cause there's some things going on in the community that I had some ideas as to what we could do differently or hopefully better. And uh, so anyway, that was my introduction to municipal politics. And so, uh, I want to go back to that very first election that you ran in. So I'm assuming that's 71 or 1970, that first election? Yeah, yeah, around 1970. And uh, there was nobody ran against me. So I was pretty you were easy victory. a pretty easy victory. But you yeah. said it was a summer village. Uh, do you mind me asking yeah. which one? Yeah, summer village of Lakeview. Lakeview. Okay. So. I got to ask the big question. You were the municipal you were on the municipal police force. What made you decide that the council position? You say people were asking you, but what were the issues that you wanted to see addressed and fixed? Well, in a small uh, summer village, it was really uh road maintenance, um uh, cleaning up the the little kind of a private beach that we maintained and uh and that was really almost all the services they provided other than uh, we had a contract, I think, with a larger municipality, probably Parkland County, to get rid of our garbage, that type of thing. So it was just uh, getting involved because I know the first winter I lived there, the road plowing wasn't very good. And I had some time I had a hard time getting out of my uh, out of the community into the mainstream. What did you learn about yourself in that position? Because I've spoken to many councillors and mayors from across this great country, and it's always fascinating to find out what they learn about themselves in that first term. Because as a councillor, you are the front lines of politics because people will know you if you go to the corner store. They will know you if they you go to uh, your local hockey game. So what did you learn about yourself and your community during those formative years as a first-term councillor? Well, like I say, the first thing you do learn is that uh, you, you know, and you, re you, I recognize that going in, you represent everybody in that community, whichever one you're your counselor in or a part of and uh so a lot of people come up to you with ideas as to what they think should be done or question you on uh what has been done so for me it became uh, obvious very early on that uh you know you're kind of the center of attention wherever you go and uh you really need to in my mind that was important for me to carry myself accordingly and you know, make sure that uh, I was being uh, upfront and 
approachable and uh, good listener and also uh, give them ideas and how I thought whatever the issue was should be moved forward. And I, I've, I've, I had the pleasure of speaking to one summer village counselor uh, earlier last year. And I want to know from you, because summer villages are such a unique uh, entity upon themselves, because they are a much smaller community than a town or even a village. How does a counselor uh, work through issues that are facing summer villages? And how did you see your role as counselor being able to address those issues because when you have an influx of people during the summer, I can imagine it's a lot harder to deal with certain issues than say in the winter when your staple residents are there. Yeah, we, you know, we had regular meetings. Um, I think we probably had uh, a few more regular meetings during the summer months when, when people are out at their cottages. But we had also, you know, we also obviously had meetings all year round and really the issues really were uh, revenue and expenses, right? So we didn't, you know, we tried to do everything we could to keep the taxes down, et cetera. So, and that was, uh, that was really the gist of it. Now they, uh, the other reason I think they wanted to uh, encourage me to sit on council was because uh, I had a bit of a police background, and uh, there, I think they had a number of break-ins back in the day. And yeah. One of my ideas as to how we could secure the community better, et cetera, et cetera. So, so did you ever like when you were first elected in nineteen seventies? Did you ever think this is a stepping stone for me? Like I, I have higher aspirations, whether it be provincial or federal politics, because that is the crux of our series that we're putting together here. Is politicians who left one level of government and moved to another. So for you, Fred, did you ever have higher aspirations or was it always well, something? Probably, yeah, probably oh, not I... at that time. Um, and interesting, I got back into municipal politics. Uh, and like you say, I've been involved in president of the community association, coach ball, coach, you know, hockey and all those things that people do. But how I got involved in the, municipal side after the 70s was uh, I was approached by the Chamber of Commerce in, in Wadman to head up a committee to change this, see if we could get the status of Wadman changed from a hamlet to a village and they wanted me to chair that committee so I said yeah I'd be glad to because there was issues going on there that I wasn't very happy with the county uh, so anyway uh, I agreed to chair the committee and we Drafted a petition, took it around, just what everybody in the community signed it. And a few months later, uh, we were a village and uh, I was encouraged to run for council. So I did. And then the council elected me as the mayor. Wow. I, I knew that you were on the village of uh, Wobbeman's council. I didn't realize you were there also when it became a village. It's, uh, yeah. I can imagine. Just take me through that process, if you can, of getting those petitions, because going from, uh, uh, I, sorry, I forget the name that you just used, but going to a village, it must be a challenge because you have to sort of educate people while you're going around to door knock and collect signatures, isn't it? Yeah, we had a, we actually, through the chamber, you know, we had a number of members involved and we all agreed to, uh, you know, we drafted up the petition as for the Municipal Government Act, and uh, we actually wrote up a, you know, a series of uh, points that we thought we, the village would benefit. You know, we would benefit by being our own village rather than being a part of a bigger municipality. So we took them around, and uh, obviously, a lot of people were not all that happy with the present situation. So I think it was something like over ninety percent of the doors that we knocked on, they signed the petition and. Then we presented it to the Minister of Municipal Affairs sometime in, I think it was October of 79. And by January 1st, 1980, we were a village. That's when you became from the former summer village of, uh, yeah, summer true. district of Lakeview to the village of Wabaman? Well, actually, I moved out of Lakeview in uh, 72. And I was in the uh, hamlet of Wabin. Like uh, if you're not a, if you're an unincorporated community and part of a, a large municipality like a county, then they, you're 
designation is a hamlet. And that's what we were, and, you know, at that time, I think uh, the community of Walden probably had about 500 people living in it. And uh, there's a few things going on that we thought we, we'd be more beneficial to be our own administration in our own village. And uh, that's the way we went. So what were some of those issues that you were facing? If you can remember, what was the pressing issue? What was the one issue that you can look back and say, this is why we chose the, to go the village route? Because I can imagine there are small, like you said, there's all these issues that are coming up that can be addressed compared to a hamlet over a village. So what was the issue that you saw that was the most pressing that you could only address if you were a village? Well, most of it was to do with... Uh... Well, probably public maintenance, road maintenance, uh, sidewalk issues, uh, water and sewer issues, those types of things. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, there was no paved streets in Wadman. Uh, some of the streets that didn't have sidewalks. Um, the sewer system was in need of uh, upgrading uh, water system as well, or, you know, water wasn't all that great and uh, so those were the pressing issues and as well as uh, taxation I think was another issue at the time the county's taxes were higher than what we established when we became a village did you ever look back mm -hmm. do you ever look back on those times and think those were the good years because I know Wobbeman has gone through a bit of a change here recently yeah, yeah. they did in, uh, they did amalgamate into Parkland County just recently I had the pleasure of sitting down yeah. with the last mayor yeah. uh mayor Smiley do you look back yeah. and say those were the good years those were the good years for Wobbeman yeah I would say so and you know the other pressing not a pressing issue but the other issue when we were just a hamlet was the uh, maintenance of our cemetery. It wasn't maintained very well, it was overgrown and the uh, fences were in tough shape. And and that was uh, a lot of the people that lived here obviously had relatives buried there and we just weren't very happy with the way it was maintained. So that was another issue that was there. And uh, I'm not sure it was a big factor, but one of the benefits of going from a hamlet to a village was the Wobbin power plant was within the boundaries and it was a, you know, a fairly significant uh, piece of infrastructure that brought the county uh, probably over $2 million worth of taxes a year. And from everything we could figure out, they were only probably putting back uh, around 100000 at the time. So, so by going to a village, uh, and when that was, so all that two and a half million dollars in came into our coffers. And uh, I think per capita at that particular time in 1980s, we were the richest, richest village per capita in the, in the province. I can, uh, I, I can imagine you were probably looked down upon for being the richest village in Alberta from probably some of your other village mayors and councillors just seeing how well your uh, infrastructure, but also your tax base is with that big giant power plant there. Yeah, there was a little bit of that. Yeah. In fact, uh, after I left municipal politics, I was a trustee on the public school board, got elected to that. And uh, so again, there was trustees there from, you know, all around the whole county area. So a lot of them felt it was ridiculous that Wobbin received all those taxes from the power plant, they thought they should be spread out and they should get some of the money, I guess. I said, well, we're the ones that have to live under the shadow of the power plant. And, and, so uh, how long were you, how long were you with the village as a elected official? Well, I served uh, four terms. The first term was short just because of that to get realigned with the provincial election. I think it was about a year. And then it was a three year term after that. And then, uh, in I think it was 19 yeah about 1985 or 86 I got elected to the Parkland School Board and again you know it was four children in school it was kind of an interest of mine and so I was on that particular school board for nine years and so you've and literally that, served in almost every possible position that you could in Alberta councillor mayor yeah. school board trustee MLA uh wow 
Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So then when I left the school board, I uh, and I left it because it was just taking up more time than I could really commit. I was very busy at work, and uh, so anyway, I uh, after a couple, I think probably a term later, I got back into municipal politics again. For it's actually after I retired. That's right. It was two thousand and one or two or something. I got back into municipal politics after I retired from my my job. So this is where the story picks up, and this is the, this yeah. is where the story gets a little fascinating for myself, yeah. because in two thousand four, so you are an, a, a counselor now for I'm assuming Wabaman, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, I was actually uh, two thousand and one. Two thousand one, you were a counselor, but you were, it was a counselor for Wabaman. Uh that's right. Yeah, I was the mayor. Yeah, yeah. you were the mayor of Wabaman, a small. Yeah. For those who don't know, it's a small uh, a village, or it was a village. That's right. Yeah, a small village of about. Yeah, at that time the population would have been around 600, 650. So, and it's just east of Edmonton. So, if you're taking the Yellowhead, just go east out of Edmonton, and you can't miss Rocky. it. Yeah, it's actually west of Edmonton. About, west, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. God. I'm getting my directions all mixed up uh, here. Oh, it's about 60 kilometers west of the city. So in 2004, was, though, yeah. you decide after, well, just getting back onto uh, Village Council as the mayor, yeah. that yeah. you're going to put your hat, the, your hat in the ring for the MLA job for the riding of Stony Plain. Now, yeah. um, Take me through the idea of why you believed at that time was the appropriate time to get involved. Well, there was a number of things. I, you know, I was the uh, I was on the board of directors of the association for years, and uh, the MLA was actually a good friend of mine. In fact, he was uh, the president of the ATA, the Alberta Teachers Association, for this area when I was on the school board and because of my negotiation experience with the job I had, uh, I was always uh, heading up the negotiations with the teachers for the, for the school board. And uh, so anyway, we had a healthy respect for each other and kind of friends and he was going to step down. So he said, you should really uh, consider running as MLAs. You do a great job and blah, blah, blah. So I talked over the family and, our children were pretty much uh, growing up into adults, and so. Uh, so that was you know, Stan, the, right? That was Stan uh, Wilson. Wilson. Stan Wilson, yes, that's yes, right. Yeah. 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 So he steps down in two thousand four. You yes. have put your name forward. Was it a contested yeah. nomination? Do you remember? Oh yes, it was contested. There was, uh, I think, five or six different people who. Uh, put your name forward for the job. So and this, then we, sorry, I won the continue. nomination. And, yeah. So this is where I find it fascinating because you come from a municipal and a school board background for elected politics. And in municipal and school board, there are no provincial parties. There are no party systems in no, that's right. yeah. smaller rural communities. Yeah. So how was that transition? Because I'm imagining as a elected official, you're not not staying on the sidelines federally or provincially. Yeah. But when you put your name forward, it's a different beast in itself because now you are aligning yourself with one particular party for you. Mm -hmm. Did your time as a municipal politician or a school board tr uh, trustee prepare you for partisan politics? Oh, definitely. Yeah. How so? Uh, just, uh, I've always been of the opinion that, uh, you know, if you don't have anything intelligent to say, it's better to keep your mouth shut and have people still guessing whether you got any or intelligent or not, rather than opening up and convince them otherwise. So I was always in any role I had in politics, unless I really had something to add to the conversation, uh, I do, I wouldn't, uh, you know, grandstand and make a speech or whatever. If I said anything, I would say I agree with so and so who says we should do this, that, the other thing, and uh, that's kind of the way I carried myself uh, even through uh, provincial politics. And, and how uh, was that experience in provincial politics? Because you are one of the only, like, few 
hundreds of people in Alberta's history who has ever had the ability to step on the floor of the legislative assembly. So take me back to that very first moment in 2004, when you walked onto that legislative floor for the very first time as an elected official. Yeah, it was uh, a moment that still kind of gives me chills. I was so proud to be standing there in the legislature of Alberta. Uh, and having uh, singing along with Paul Oriel, uh, you know, O Canada at the opening of the of the session of the day, it was just so uh, so I don't know so gratifying and satisfying, and I was really uh, somewhat in awe of you know of the of especially of the legislature, and uh, as it turns out, I was friends of uh, Ralph Klein's father. Um, and I'd met Ralph a few times actually uh, before that and so I was pretty proud to serve on his team and uh, Ralph and I kind of became friends and uh, he would always you know we'd always exchange pleasantries every time we met and so if, yeah it was just a real it's really hard to describe with the stand up in that legislature and sing O Canada to the top of your lungs uh, it was just uh, such an honor and a privilege. It's hard to describe it. What was the issue that you were looking to champion while you were in the legislature? Because everyone has their reasons why they want to get into politics, whether it be an issue, local issue, a provincial issue, a federal issue. You you had the chance to deal with some local issues in Wabaman, in Lakeview, as a school board trustee. But when you moved to provincial politics, was there an issue that was pressing for you that you said, you know what, I believe my voice would be the best person to elevate this issue so that way it gets on the provincial radar and we can address it well there's a number of uh number of issues one i i've ridden motorcycles for years and it always uh bothered me looking at the statistics that accidents happen to most motorcycle operators within their first five ten thousand kilometers of riding so I I thought that, and I still believe that today, that uh, before anybody gets granted a, 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 motor, a licensed operator a motorcycle, they should have to go through, a, you know, a training program to uh, learn how to handle a bike, learn how to fall off, et cetera, et cetera. So that was one of my issues. Uh, the other one was basically just... Uh, making sure that uh, the citizens of my constituency receive the best bang for their buck and, uh, you know, in regards to provincial uh, grants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those were the kind of the things that drove me. I was interested, I've always kind of been interested as a previous policeman in policing and uh, how, uh, how the province managed that. And uh, one piece of sound advice that Stan Washington gave me was he said, when you first get into your caucus meetings, you know, and there's what's that time, there's about 70 of us in the conservative caucus. He said, uh, just sit and sit there and listen for a while, see how, make sure you understand how things work. And, uh, and if you have something important to say, say it. So I took that advice. That was kind of my style anyway. And, uh, after I'd been in there a while, I'd, you know, I'd get a little more vocal and get to know a few more people. And I remember uh, Iris Evans, who was a minister before I got elected, she came up to me one day and she says, Fred, I just have to give you credit. She says, uh, you're one of the guys that when you speak, everybody's listening and the whole room goes quiet. And she says, can you tell me why that is? I said, yes. I said, number one, I speak pretty quietly. Number two, I don't speak unless I think I've got something intelligent to add to the conversation. So she says, I wish more MLAs would follow that trend. But anyway, that was kind of my introduction to it. Um, you, you had the pleasure of serving alongside Ralph Klein. You, you got elected in 2004, his last term as premier of this province. Um, yeah. People use Ralph Klein as the staple of what a conservative is today. You had the pleasure to serve side by side with him for a few years. You knew his father, as you said. 
What type of man was Ralph Klein in your words? Uh, I I felt that uh, he was probably would and should go down in history as probably the greatest premier in the province. He was kind of he was the kind of guy who could talk to anybody. You know, he was uh, down to earth. Um, you know, he had his issues here and there, but if he made a mistake, he would apologize and promise to do better and move on. And uh, you can't give a guy much more credit than that. And uh, do you was, think politicians uh, today can learn something from Ralph Klein? Oh, I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I like how you chuckled there, Fred. <laughs> what can they learn? Well, I think uh, just learn to be upfront and honest. And it's just, it seems to me that today there's too many that just follow the party line and uh, don't do enough thinking for themselves. And even when I was in there, I would say out of the 70 MLAs who were conservatives, and that was the one thing that surprised me. Well, once I get into provincial politics, these are all going to be really sharp people and motivated and uh, informed. And, and really the quality of the people who are MLAs really wasn't any difference than they were on school boards or municipal politics there. Out of the group of 70, I would say there was 25 maybe that were what I would call real good conservatives and uh, people who had some ideas and could... Uh, could add to the growth of the province benefit. I want to I want to pick up on something you just said, and this goes back to the idea of why we are doing this series. You said that, that you were shocked that there are sort of quote unquote whipped votes where you, there's not a lot of independent thinking because you are asked to toe party line. Um, yeah. How hard was that to adapt to as a former municipal councillor or school board trustee? Because I can imagine as a councillor, as a trustee, you're voting on what you believe is the best interest of your constituents. When you're elected into a partisan politics, whether it be provincial or federal, the party is asking you to vote the way that the party wishes you to do. Now, I'm not saying you were whipped. I'm not saying that you didn't vote for your constituents' th uh, viewpoints. But how hard was it to be asked to vote for something that you might not have agreed with so wholeheartedly that may not benefit your residents that much? Well, it was not difficult because even in the municipal politics and the school board, et cetera, you'd have your own opinion and you'd vote however you felt. But at the, at the end of the day, you know, as being the mayor, uh, whatever the decision your council makes, uh, you have to live with that. And uh, and I did. I would tell people, well, how come uh, you guys did this and that? And I said, that was the wishes of council. I wouldn't necessarily say that I voted for it or against it. I said, that was the majority of council thought we should go that way. And that's the way we went. And so when I got into provincial politics, and it might be a little different, you know, with some of the premiers we've had recently, but under Ralph Klein, uh, everybody, you know, we had our caucus meetings and that's where things were brought up and you talk things out uh, in caucus and uh, then caucus would vote on it and whatever the vote was, uh, you went along with it. And uh, if you really felt strong and it was something that was, you know, against your religion or whatever, you had the option of uh, stepping outside of the chamber when, uh, or the legislature when that particular item was voted on. Did you ever do that, if you don't mind me asking? No, I never did. You always believed in what you were voting upon, I'm assuming? Well, I either believed in it or I voted, uh, you know, I voted in favor of it. And if anybody asked me, I, you know, I would say that was, the, again, that's the direction of our government or caucus, and I support it. Whether I believed in it or, or not, personally, I, I believe that decisions are, in a lot of cases, are best made by a number of inputs from people before you arrive at that decision. And uh, if you believe in democracy, you believe that the majority uh, comes up with the right decisions. So two years after you're first elected in 2004 provincially, Ralph Klein steps down as premier of this province and Ed Stelmack, premier of uh, premier of Alberta, Ed Stelmack, is appointed or leader Ed Stelmick is appointed as premier. Yeah. How long after 
Premier Stelmec is uh, appointed, do you get the phone call to say, we want you in cabinet? Well, it's interesting because I was one of the uh, seven MLAs who supported that during the, uh, you know, his campaign for leadership of the party. And uh, his office, as it turns out, was right next door to mine. So right after uh, he won the uh, leadership, him and his wife came into the into our offices there, and uh, I was in there late doing some work, and so he called me in, and uh, we were chatting, and so I asked him. I said, uh, "So we were in what they call the annex, which was a big office building that was actually outside of the legislature." So I asked him. I said, "So when are you going to be moving into the uh, legislature?" He said, "The same time as you." I said, "Oh," he said, "Yes." He said, "I." obviously plan on appointing you to cabinet. We didn't really discuss the position at that time, but I was also on his uh, transition team to, you know, to set up a new direction for the government. So that was when I got the inside information that, uh, you know, confidentially from him that I would be in cabinet. Of course, you got to keep all that stuff close to the vest until it's made public. And I did that. And so what was it about Ed that made you want to endorse him? Was it just because you were side by side with him in the annex or was there an issue or was there a passion that you saw in Ed Stalmack that you said, you know what, he's the man for to be premier of this province? Yeah, well, there was three that ran uh, at that time. There's Ed and Ted Morton and uh, Jim Dinning. And Jim, I actually had the privilege of working with Jim. And Ted, I actually like Ted as well. He was a very intelligent man. Um, but out of the three of them, I just felt that Ed had the qualities that I respected the most. And uh, and that's who I chose to, uh, to help uh, with his campaign. And I let him know that fairly early on. So you, so being sworn in as an MLA is a beast in itself, but you got the ability to serve in cabinet. And that, mm -hmm. again, talking about 100 people over like 900 people who've had the ability to serve as MLA, less than that have been able to serve in cabinet. What was the pleasure and responsibility that you put upon yourself while you were sworn in as cabinet, but when you fulfilled your duties as cabinet minister? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting process because, uh, yeah, when I got the call and then got sworn in and he told me he wanted me to be the Solicitor General and Minister of Public Security and uh, kind of went over what the responsibilities were. Like I was in charge of policing, I was in charge of corrections, in charge of uh, gaming and liquor, horse racing, and then, of course, public security. He just said, I think you're the guy with the personality who can handle this job and look forward to you being on the team and uh, I'm sure you'll do a great job. So, yeah. it, you know, it, it went, so my focus then changed from uh, representing just my constituency, of course, to representing all of Albertans uh, in, the, in that portfolio. So I had over uh, 7,000 people, I guess, through my ministry that reported up through to me. So it was a pretty big uh, ministry, and uh, but I just loved it, uh, loved the challenge. And, uh, you know, there was some, obviously some pretty difficult things you deal with in, those, in that portfolio, but uh, I really enjoyed the challenge and uh, enjoyed my time spent there. I made One some of changes there that are still in effect today. What were, what were some of the changes, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, well, I set up the uh, expanded alert, which is the Alberta Law Enforcement Response Teams, and really uh, an organization we set up to fight organized crime. So we brought in, before we had alert, you know, we had you know, the RCMP, City of Calgary, City of Edmonton, Medicine Hat, Flatbridge, Camrose six or seven different police forces. And uh, what would happen is organized crime would move into, a, say, a Medicine Hat. And then when the Medicine Hat police got close to uh, closing in on them, then they would pull up stakes and move to Lethbridge or wherever else. And then the, there was no sharing of information. 
and that was a big drawback. So um, it was just getting set up when I became the sole gen, and I really expanded on it. Seconded police officers from every police department in Alberta. It really had a positive effect on you know, on fighting the illicit drug trade, etc., in, in the province. I, I got to ask the sort of question that's off topic, but sort of in this realm. There's been a lot of talk of provincial police forces in uh, Alberta recently. During your time as Solicitor General and Public Security, did the idea of provincial police force ever come up? And what's your opinion on it? Well, at that particular time, <laughs> back in 2006, the previous Solicitor General was heading in that direction. And uh, the relationship with the RCMP in Alberta at that time wasn't very good. But I, uh, I, I had and still have a lot of respect for the RCMP. So I kind of mended that relationship and uh, strengthened that and uh, also expanded a sheriff program in Alberta because the concern was uh, highway patrol is one of the lower priorities for the RCMP and they were short of members and uh, struggling with uh, their other duties. And uh, you could see the uh, accident rates in our highways uh, going up and speed on Highway 2 from Emden to Calgary uh, was just getting ridiculous and the rest of the province not much better. So that's why we brought in, uh, expanded on the sheriff's program. And when I think when I became a soldier, there was like 25 uh, sheriffs working in highways in Alberta. And within a year, I think I had up to about 125. And it really, really made a difference on the number of accidents and fatalities on the highways. So, and I also got them working uh, very closely with the RCMP. And uh, again, just having them working with the RCMP, uh, again, has made the roads that much safer. So I want to jump forward here because I'm just cautious yeah. of time here, Fred. And that is yeah. in 2012, you decide that you're going to leave provincial politics after two terms. Yeah. So you were elected yeah. in 2004 and then 2008, you're reelected. Um, was that what you wanted to and done? You were comfortable with only serving two terms because uh, there have been people who have served more terms or people who have just served one term. But for you, was two terms enough for you? Yeah, I I still believe today that I don't think politics, especially at that level, should be a career. I just saw too many people uh, of all parties in the legislature who uh, kind of forget uh, that they're there to represent the people and it's not about them. You know, I don't know. I just, I think if you can't get what you want done within eight years and give somebody else a torch. And do you feel like you accomplished uh, what you wanted in eight years? Yeah, I did. I think I left uh, politics with Alberta being a little better place. The other, one of my other attributes that I did when I was a soldier and when I started up the CERT, which was a serious incident response team. When I became a soldier and if something serious happened in Edmonton, they would call on two or three officers from Calgary to come up and investigate to make sure that the police acted in the right fashion, et cetera, et cetera. But that was widely criticized because, you know, it's brothers investigating brothers. So I set up an independent agency called the CERT. And within a few years, it wasn't long before I had calls from right across Canada as to how we set this thing up and how it was working. And I think almost every jurisdiction across the country now has a, an independent uh, watchdog over the police. And the complaints just dropped right off as soon as we uh, got that up and running. So after you've served a extensive career in municipal politics, school board trustee, provincial politics, I'm assuming this is the point in time when you actually retire and just relax from elected politics. But then I realized, no, you decide to go back and to try to go back into municipal politics, correct? That's correct. And it was really because of the fact that uh, in Wadman, when the uh, power plant uh, shut down. You know, the village lost probably at that time one and a half million dollars in tax revenue. And prior to that, we, we knew that day was coming. So we actually, previous councils had set up a bank account of had over $10 million in it, uh, you know, to transition from going from a 
municipality that was reliant on one big industrial tax base to one that could be self-sustaining, uh, you know, with this smaller industrial and commercial tax base. And so we felt the way to be self-sufficient was to grow the population of Wadman. So we actually uh, put that money aside to grow the village, but that really never happened for a whole number of reasons. And anyway, I don't want to get into that, but at the end of the day, uh, councils uh, spent that $10 million basically to uh, keep the village afloat until such time as the money was all gone. And that's when I got back into politics. I was uh, into the municipal politics it was to uh, see if there was any way we could salvage a village. And uh, if not, as it turned out, I, uh, I led the committee to uh, downgrade the village back to a hamlet. So the same guy who uh, chaired the committee to make it from a hamlet to a village chaired the committee to go the other way around. And, was that and a hard choice? Saying, was that a no. hard choice? Because I can imagine you put your blood, sweat, and tears back in the 70s to make it a village. And then you're now going, okay, this project that I started maybe not maybe wasn't the right decision and we need to go back into a uh the a hamlet and be incorporated back into parkland county yeah well yes uh, i was i still am i'm very disappointed that the village went back to a hamlet but that being said looking at over the financial situation and uh full number of circumstances and the fact that the County has really changed the way they govern as well. It, it was the right decision. And uh, after being under the county now for, I guess, a couple of years or so, I'm still convinced it was the right decision at this time for the villagers to go back to a helmet. So I want to wrap up with this question, Fred, because you have had an extensive career in politics, whether it be school board, municipal, as mayor, as councillor, as MLA, as cabinet minister. Looking back on your time in politics, what was the one role that you really enjoyed the most? I think the role that I enjoyed the most was being Alberta Solicitor General and Minister of Public Security. I really enjoyed working with the police and our corrections people. In fact, the other day I had a corrections officer come up to me at a Remembrance Day ceremony and go up to me and look me in the eye and he said, I just want you to know you're still my favorite minister. He said, you've done so much to improve corrections in Alberta. He said that your legacy will live on forever. So that and please, I still got some very good uh, friends in the police force and uh, and even through uh, CSIS and uh, public security. Uh, yeah, it was just a role that I really enjoyed. And uh, although the hours were, I think the wife figured that I was probably averaging about 86 hours a week. Wow. And it was such a rewarding position. And I, I just never really got tired. And uh, in fact, it was hard for me to settle down to a, be a regular MLA only working 40 or 50 hours a week. But anyway, it was time for me to move on, and uh, I'm pretty proud of what I did, and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. So the last question I have for you here, Fred, is this. You, as we've said, this series is about politicians going from one level of government to another. Do you think politicians are better equipped to serve provincially and federally if they have that municipal background of governance background, or do you think that it doesn't matter who you are, you, the best person should always win, no matter what your background is? I think the best person should win. And, you know, going back to the question of whether uh, your previous experience benefits you, I think it does, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a municipal or politics. Um, in fact, I've seen some municipal politicians who get elected to the legislature who really struggle there because they become just a pretty small fish in a big bowl, and they're, you know, they might be mayors or whatever of the communities they came from, and they were the top dog there, and they get into the province, and they're just another cog in the gear kind of thing. So it, it can work both ways. I think uh, you know one. One of the things that benefited me was my, I worked at Transalta Utilities for over 30 years and uh, finished my career up there as a 
manager of community and media relations. So uh, not only did that make me well known through the area that I, I ran in, but uh, also gave me some pretty good experience as to uh, and knowledge as to you know how to act and how to uh, work with the media, etc. And I think it uh, I had pretty good respect from a lot of the media people who worked in the legislature and because I even in question period I was one of the few guys who'd get up there if someone asked me a question I would give them an answer whether they liked it or not uh, and that's the way I worked with the constituents as well if somebody phoned me with a question I said I will get back to you I said you may not like the answer but uh, I'm going to give it to you the way I see it and so that people respect that and I think that's all you can do I agree. That's all you can do. Be truthful and not front and just answer the questions to the best of your ability. Like you have done for the last 40 minutes, um, Fred, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and chatting. It's always a pleasure to hear from someone like yourself, but also hear from someone who has served on different levels of government. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. It was a great conversation. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews. We will be back tomorrow with our interview with MLA Searle Turton. He was a former councillor who turned into a provincial politician as well. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Mm -hmm.